Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Deepak Chopra, and uh, we are continuing our series with luminaries, influencers, and people who are making a great difference in the world to bring us to a more peaceful, joyful, sustainable, healthier world. And today, it's my great privilege to welcome to our show, um, uh, popularly known as Daji, uh, Kamlesh Patel Daji as his followers call him. I had the great privilege to visit his ashram in India and I was totally taken with the sincerity and devotion of all the people practicing meditation. I have to say I've never seen a, a larger crowd collectively meditating uh, together. Uh, Daji has uh, authored many books in the past, The Heartfulness Way with Joshua Pollock, it was among the top 10 best selling books in, um, in Hindustan Times Nielsen chart. His book Designing Destiny was released in February 2019. He's also written a book called The Wisdom Bridge, which was released um, 2022. But today we are talking about his fourth book, Spiritual Anatomy, Meditation Chakras and the Journey to the Center, which was just released in October. Um, and in 2023. Daji, thanks for joining me today. It's a great privilege to have you. Thank you, Badevaya. Thank you so much. And having me here on your very prestigious, noble platform. And I'm a normal person. You have <laughs> taken me as an eliminaries, and that makes me surprised also. Well, well the book right. that you have introduced is a, it's a practical it's an expression in words of the pers personal experiences we all go through while meditating. And it describes as how the field around us keeps changing uh, depending upon the chakra that we are stationed at. That changes the consciousness. The field is changed because of that. Also, when we reach higher in superconscious state, but often due to our daily life, it is so challenging. It brings us down. So we swing between superconscious and the normal state as such. And depending upon the heights we have achieved during the morning meditation, this field also oscillates until we attain some sort of permanency. And that's what uh, yoga calls it as eternal life or nirvana, where the field is no longer restricted to your periphery or your heart, but it expands into the universe. And that's what is called Brahmagati. Uh, Brahma means to expand and contemplate. So you no longer think and move. Thinking and moving is very limited at a human level, but the same human can expand and contemplate at the same time. And this expansion, I think, can be cosmic expansion. Your field becomes limitless. And that's what we are trying to share via this book in the form of words, words only. We have to practice, practice and practice in order to experience different levels. So, Aji, when I was with you, when I was with you, I received the uh -huh. book. Unfortunately, my my library was reconstructed uh, and I can't find it here, but we'll show it here. Uh, if you can, uh, if you have the book, please show it. Otherwise, we'll uh, be giving a link. So that's the book called Spiritual Anatomy. And Daji, uh, one thing you just said, uh, the field. So I, along with uh, you, believe that consciousness is a field that transcends both space and time. That, you know, Western <clears throat> neuroscience restricts consciousness to the brain, uh, which is very limited. 
the brain is just part of the field and it's not really the source of consciousness. So can you expand a little bit on the field? And also in your book, you mention several chakras. Now, most people, first of all, they're not even aware what chakras are. A lot of the audience here will want to know what are chakras. But even if they're aware, they think of seven chakras. You talk about, I believe, 18 chakras in your book. So, you know, I've always thought of chakras as junction points between the field of consciousness and our biology. But can you share your insights, both on the chakras, the field, and the expansion that you talk about in your book? It's not just seven chakras. True. Um, there are three basic chakras, uh, Muladhar, Swadhisthan, and Manipur. Over and above that, at the human level, we begin our progress from the heart chakra. The below three chakra are common with animals as well. So we, our journey uh, practically starts from heart chakra. And continuing from the heart chakra are 13 chakras. So 13, including heart and above, and three below. So that makes totally 16 chakras. 16, 16 sorry. Right. Now... <clears throat> There are infinite chakras in between. Infinite stations are in between there. But a practicant who really go, goes through all that will be able to make a detailed note of it as personal experience. As far as space and time transcendence is concerned, so often people don't understand. Even I found it very difficult to understand how to transcend time? What is time? What is space? How to transcend space? You see? And all these are possible only when we close our eyes and allow our consciousness to travel. Travel beyond the present, beyond the now, into the past, as well as into the future. And when we collapse, a time comes in meditation when the past, present, and the future, everything collapses. That's when we are able to read things that may have happened in the past. And that's how we are able to read things that can happen in the future. But this future is very fluid. It's dynamic. So what can happen can also change. What I see that something may happen may not really happen also because there are many factors influencing this change. I can say if nothing changes, no other factors change. But if we go on at the present trajectory, this is going to happen. But I am not the only controller or regulator of the outcome of any futuristic activities. There are billions and billions of infinite factors, not restricted to this earth, but other galaxies and beyond these galaxies. As far as time is concerned, consciousness, how to perceive things that is not in the now. I, but we are, I would like to share one example with you. you know, I, I practice as a pharmacist in New York City, and we were always looking for uh, pharmacy locations to start new uh, businesses. And my favorite location has always been a hospital. So one of my pharmacist managers, she comes up and says, my brother is working in a grocery store, and that grocery store is for sale. Uh, and it's exactly in front of a hospital which you're looking for. I say, okay, let's go right now. And we went, looked for the spot. And precisely, it's a great, great, great location where you can fill thousands of scripts a day and make perhaps millions in a year. Those days I used to smoke. <laughs> so just to express my courtesy, just visiting the grocery store I borrowed, my Marlboro packet and lit up a cigarette and immediately the response, I had to run to bathroom, see, to restroom. And I unzipped myself and as I do that, there was immediate descending of a very force, uh, very gross and very lead-like, you know, heavy lead or heavy mercury-like force descending around me. Uh, afraid, perhaps, that 
I had the resonance feeling of fear, but I was not afraid. But what I did was I could not relieve myself. I just had to come out. Later on, on my way, I asked the manager, what, what's in the bathroom? What's in the restroom? So she told me, you know, the grocery store is for sale because there was a murder just a few weeks back in that store. And the people who came with a the gun, they shot the manager in the bathroom, in that restroom. And that soul was still there. Now, something that happened in the past, in a different time zone, how are you able to perceive it? Because that fear, that moment was crystallized in that space and time. So I decided not to go with it, though there was a potential of making lots of money. Similarly, futuristic things can also happen. Often people see the dreams. And you may not realize what's the, what this dream is telling you about. But after 10 years, 15 years, if you have maintained a note and see your written note, and after 15 years, you come to know, oh, I had that dream. And it's like, you know, I saw this place and I met these people in my dream. So many things can happen like that. And you have, I think, also witnessed brighter mind here. How, when we define consciousness, consciousness, simply put to me, the degree of awareness, how aware we become. Now, you had seen that person had closed the eyes and you were able to pick up a colored ball in your hand and the child was able to tell the color of that ball. I saw, yeah, I saw saw that. Right? And there was no touch. There was no eye contact. There was no hearing. No five senses were involved in recognizing that color. So it makes one wonder, how does this awareness transcend the space? How does it cross the barrier? And some of these children are able to narrate uh, experiences of, for example, if I ask, what is the dress so-and-so wearing in this city. You just have to show a photograph of a person and in a few minutes they will tell you that they are wearing this. And you had already seen another scenario where you felt that a monk, a place that you were going to visit. Um, and, and I think in Ladakh, you were yes. going to visit that. And you said this place is supercharged. A lot of energy is there. And out of curiosity, just to learn what these children with blindfold could do, that boy said, with the blindfold, just touching your phone with a picture of that location, he said, there is no more energy there. Yeah. Energy, energy is lost. Yes. That means, and you already know that the person who was responsible for that energy he is passed. no longer, he passed away. Yeah. So I think consciousness can be tapped into, the field can be tapped into. But we need some level of discipline, some level of resonance within us. Uh, selfishness, ego, desires. I think these are the true rep repellent against perfect awareness. These abilities are now being understood as dormant, non-local potentials because our Fundamental awareness transcends space-time, especially when we have the experience of Turiya, and then we can, you know, through intentionality, locate events in different locations of space-time. I think that is becoming clear slowly to science, although science takes a long time to catch up. But these children that I saw at your ashram were extraordinary, I have to say, including a young boy who could... Uh, do archery blindfold and hit the target, which was something I had never seen before. <laughs> yes, so, he, could, he could read with his feet also. <laughs> yes, I saw, yeah. that, I saw that too. Uh, I'm speaking to uh, Daji, as he's popularly and lovingly referred to by his 
disciples, um, Kamlesh Patel Daji. His fourth book is called Spiritual Anatomy, Meditation Chakras and the Journey to the Center. And it was released in the United States and Canada in October 2023. So it's now available in bookstores and also on online stores. I read it on my way back to the United States and I found it extraordinarily illuminating and enlightening. So I'm requesting all of you who are listening to check the book out. Daji, tell us a little bit about this wonderful place that you uh, have in uh, in India because I'd never seen anything like it and some of the programs that are happening there. Well, there's a little progression in the ideas, how ideas evolved, you know. As a student, when I started this meditation, and whenever the meditators came together, there were no facilities. And I do remember I used to sleep on an open ground without any mattress under the tree. And that goes back in 1979, 1980. And little bit, little by little, progresses were made, facilities improved. And I was wondering why certain group of individuals from society are missing out on this meditation. It's such a beautiful thing. So in order to attract entire strata of society, we made facilities that would uh, attract not only wealthy people, but middle class, upper middle, lower middle, poor people. They should not feel that, oh, it's only for the rich. And uh, rich people should not also feel that, you know, we don't belong here. So we had a beautiful facility covering 1,400 acres. And we have a four-star hotel dormitory that can occupy 5,000 individuals and that can stay in an air-conditioned dorm and open tents, beautiful tents, and lush greenery all around. And uh, all the volunteers worked day in and day out. and change this barren desert-like land where there was water level 800, 900 feet below the ground. Now it's 50 feet, 100 feet below the ground and the entire environment in Telangana, especially this location, has changed. We enjoy, right now you won't be able to imagine the temperature here, it's, it's 20 degree centigrade. And it's because of this uh, vegetation. The moment you go out of this ashram, it will be four to five degrees higher. It's, it's lovely. And vibrations here, the, the energy field is quite unique. You can, even if you are not a believer of such esoteric things, the moment you enter and the moment you leave the place, you'll see the drastic change. Uh, the energy just grabs you like a magnet and it holds you and holds you in its field of peace and tranquility. Moment you go out, you feel that something is amiss. So that is this place. It's a magical place. I had uh, the good fortune of looking at all the sandalwood trees that you had planted there, which yes. uh, you know, bring an amazing fragrance to the atmosphere as well. Yes, so, yes. Daji is also president of Sri Ram Chandra Mission. He's Global Guide of Heartfulness Institute. He's the founder of Heartfulness Education Trust. And his predecessor was Sri Parthasar III uh, Rajagopal Chari. Can you t t tell us a little bit about the Sahaj Yoga tradition, which is basically the the extension now of heartfulness meditation is comes from this great tradition yes. of your predecessors can you tell us a little bit about them well and they are i would call them as spiritual scientists they are the one who invented this uh, lost art of pranahuti lost art of transmission that works beyond space beyond time now, how does one feel that this is beyond space and beyond time? I'll give you an example. <clears throat> uh, transmission 
this pranahuti is something very unique to this system. The original founder, original innovator of this pranahuti was Lalaji, born in 1873. He could transmit this and nourish, nourish our inner being. You know, we are all familiar with the physical system, physical body. We need nourishment, balanced diet. And there is also a qualitative difference, sattvic, rajasic, tamasic, all kinds of foods are there. People who are vegetarian, even within the vegetarian, there, are, there is a group of sattvic, rajasic, and tamasic. Also, when you take food, what time you take food also changes the quality of the food. And with what attitude you take food also changes the uh, nature of food. So it's a whole uh, game. And he classified all these things. Second thing, we can nourish our mind through interaction with elders like, you know, philosophers. I don't call science as a moral education to the system. Science can tell us how to use our time efficiently, time management space management, material management, but how to manage the inner emotions is beyond science. And still further, if we have to see how to nourish our spirit, how to nourish our being, our soul, then we have no answer. First of all, because we don't even think what can nourish the soul. The idea is redundant, nobody thinks about it. But this pranahuti, once received during meditation, you can feel a shift in your awareness and you feel, okay, yes, I am enriched to a, to a great level because of this receiving of transmission, pranahuti. And that changes everything. So the, all the credit goes to the first founder of the system, Lalaji, who invented this pranahuti. Second striking thing I like the most is, the you know, we all carry, we are the harbingers of various impressions. We develop different cognates within our consciousness and we identify, recognize things based on the positioning or capturing of these cognates. That's why the word cognition. I cannot cognate anything unless I have referred to it in my past. And all these cognitions, either they are at a temporal level or at an emotional level. I, it's like, you know, when we have a fight with a friend and who no, is no longer a friend after that fight. So we, we collect these cognates in our, in our consciousness. One remains as a memory, another remains as an emotion. Spiritual person, because of the practice, can say, okay, I forgive my friend. I for, I, but I cannot forget that, that memory. So which is good, actually, because memory teaches us something. When we forgive, the emotional memory is wiped out, which is good for our consciousness. Because as long as we don't forgive, somehow consciousness gravitates and it shrinks. It doesn't go into the outer limits. So the, the heartfulness way of practice also offers techniques how to get rid of these past cognates, past impressions. That's a very great specialty of it. Third specialty is all are, all the guides of the system are family uh, members. You know, they are married, they have an ideal family, and they advocate material life, our so-called daily life, and the spiritual life must go together. You just cannot sacrifice one for the other. Both must be integrated. Nothing forcefully, but in a very natural way. So the system is meant for a householder, not for an ascetic. It has to be followed uh, in a natural order. I had the great privilege of joining you early morning in meditation. That space accommodates several thousand people, right? It was almost yes. like a sports stadium, except <laughs> that it was dedicated to meditation. 
Yes, our ashram has a capacity to host 40,000. Uh, they can stay overnight, 40,000 people, but they, there is enough space for 100,000 people coming together and meditate. So it's quite huge and uh, it's a rare, rare thing to find such a facility. Uh, the beautiful thing with this is every corner, every nook and corner of this place is lush green. Yes, exactly. And this greenery is rare to find in such a place like Telangana. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's been a great privilege to speak to Daji. Uh, by the way, he's also recipient of one of the highest awards from the government of India, Padma Bhushan. He uh, is uh, uh, been uh, recognized by the House of Lords, the UK India Triumph Awards, and many other awards. Um, he's the author of four books, but the latest book is about not only heartfulness meditation, spiritual anatomy, but many techniques that will take you beyond ordinary consciousness to higher states of consciousness. Please pick up the book. And Daji, it's been a great privilege to talk to you. Always an honor. And I hope to see you again in the near future. Thank you, Bharabhiya. Thank you, Thank you so much. You. Looking forward to your visits. Thank yes. you. Thank you. 